So um, I'm gonna let me let me kick off uh, the next um, speaker, uh, Ken Mandel. Um, Ken Mandel, um, one of his titles is the director of computational health information program at, at Children Boston Children's Hospital, um, and he is going to talk about um, uh, parsimonious standards for extraordinary outcomes, universal regulated APIs, and healthcare fire. So. Uh, Ken, take it away. All right. First of all, I'd like to say that um, Jeff Klan's presentation was really exceptionally clear um, and helpful. Uh, Jeff, congratulations. That was, that was very few people can explain those ontologies and their relationship that clearly. Thanks, Ken. So um, uh, let me start in the midst of a pandemic with some thoughts that I wrote down in a previous uh, infectious disease public health crisis, and that was Ebola six years ago. A man named Thomas Duncan walked into the Texas Presbyterian Emergency Department and um, the triage nurse asked him, should you, um, uh, where, where have you traveled? And he appropriately said Liberia, and she appropriately wrote that down in the electronic health record. Then she took his temperature, he had a fever. Um, that was recorded in the electronic health record. And nowhere in that electronic health record did anything particular happen um, to signal to people at the Texas Presbyterian Medical Center that being from Liberia and having a fever at that point was a major problem that should have caused Star Trek uh, uh, Enterprise red alert uh, klaxons to go off. Uh, and in fact, the gentleman was sent back to the waiting room where he infected two nurses, was discharged home with the diagnosis of simple viral syndrome, came back and died. Um, so a bad outcome, bad set of outcomes. And the hospital briefly blamed the electronic medical record in the press. Um, the electronic medical record company, one many of you may be familiar with, um, uh, has a way to respond to those kinds of things. And it was uh, uh, retracted. Um, and what happened next was um, uh, a similar kind of, uh, a different kind of mess uh, involving the CDC than, than we're seeing today. But the CDC um, got in touch with all the electronic medical record companies um, and tried to get them to figure out how Liberia plus fever could now signal a, um, uh, a problem in a decision support system. And uh, then the electronic medical record companies had to eat, in turn get in touch with all of their clients and all their clients had to put down everything that they were doing and implement these new sort of like um, band-aid uh, decision support algorithms inside their, uh, inside their systems. These were one-off systems. Uh, these were one-off implementations. Um, fortunately, and not, not another a uh, patient came to our shores, except a couple that we imported ourselves to, to uh, treat them here in the United States, but no one just showed up de novo with Ebola, so none of that work proved to ever be used clinically. What I wrote in here was, wouldn't it be nice if the, there was an interoperability to the degree that we could, A, expose data resources to an app such that Liberia was not and fever was not a unique geographic clinical combination uh, and a one-off um, system to address it, but that all geographies could inform clinical care um, and the data resources could be exposed in that way. And secondly, wouldn't it be nice if you could update your triage app or your, uh, for the electronic medical record with, with, in, with uh, case definitions that evolve over time. You could see some of these same ideas being relevant today. Um, and interoperability, um, which is no, which this community is no stranger to, 
um, with the uh, incredible um, I2B2 system running across, um, uh, you know, very large numbers of hospitals and um, providing a backbone. Um, interoperability is key to progress in healthcare, the kind of progress we want to see, the kind of progress we've been talking about today in addressing COVID. Um, whoops, sorry. So Tim Berners-Lee, um, to share preprints, you know, invented the World Wide Web kind of a little bit by accident, kind of a little bit on purpose, but he just did a few things. He did um, uh, hypertext markup language so that his preprints could look nice and have formatting. Um, he did HTTP so he could move these things around. He did a web browser so that you could actually render the preprints wherever you were. And then um, he served them up um, with HTTPD. And he was um, wise enough to bring these into complete standardization through the World Wide Web Consortium. So I, on a smaller scale, um, but it, I think still important for healthcare, let me argue that if there are a few important uh, interoperability uh, um, paradigms now that can help us actually achieve scale and do things that were not necessarily predetermined, but that can be innovated. So there was a $48 billion investment in health information technology. Partners alone has spent more than $2 billion. We think the total may be north of a half a trillion dollars in um, investment at the federal level, maybe north of a trillion. Um, the Gartner hype curve helps us to understand how massive investments are made in technologies at the peak of inflated expectations and how we are now on this slope of enlightenment toward a plateau of productivity. Um, uh, and, you know, that plateau includes things like realizing that these electronic health records don't produce data that are bulletproof as illustrated by recent retractions of high profile COVID articles based on electronic medical record data. So Zach and I were awarded a um, grant from uh, the federal government to design an API that would allow some of those things that eventually we, uh, I, I wrote about in that Ebola article, um, but uh, that would allow essentially one app to be substituted for another the same way Steve Jobs used the iPhone API to have substitutable apps that could be added or deleted. And we said, couldn't this, wouldn't this be nice to happen in, in healthcare and on electronic health records, especially since you're spending $48 billion on non-interoperable systems. So our team, and Sean Murphy was a core member of our team from the beginning, uh, and Jeff Klan uh, joined later. Um, and the first thing we did was to uh, eat our own dog food by creating a, our first app. We were inspired by this contest in Wired, this, this, where they commissioned uh, graphic artists to reimagine this version of a laboratory information system. And a guy named Dave McCandless developed what would still be 10 years later, a futuristic looking version of a laboratory information system uh, that has a lot of usability and understandability and uh, readability for both physicians and patients about communicating cardiac risk. It took our developer one week to turn that app, uh, that, that, that picture in Wired Magazine, which as we say was fully implemented in Photoshop, into a fully functioning app. Here is the app running on three open source record systems, one of which you'll recognize over on the right is I2B2. And um, uh, the R in smart is reusable, and this is the reusability of the app unmodified running on three different systems that we had enough control over to implement the smart API on top of. So S is substitutable, R is reusable, and the point is that the same app should run anywhere in the healthcare system. 
we had a contest and the winners of the contest were a, a small company called Polyglot that had user-facing patient-friendly medication instructions in 15 different languages. Now they've got 24 different languages. And they turned this resource of thousands and thousands of documents that were dynamically created in their software into a smart app. It took them 48 hours to call across the, the candidate, the then candidate smart API, um, the medication list in uh, Rx norm profiled, um, and um, uh, to turn their app into a smart app. We wrote up last year that uh, this in JMIR as a commercial success. This company went on asking for the API, tuned their whole business model to use the API instead of engaging in one-off integrations. They now appear in all the vendor app stores. They were acquired by First Data Bank, which was in turn acquired by Hearst Publication. Um, they were going concerned. This is a commercially viable way to distribute innovations. At home, we developed the first functional smart app at Boston Children's um, when we went to Dan Nigren and asked him what we might be able to do that would be useful at home. He had good insight into that because Children's had been on the queue at Cerner for three years waiting for a visualization of blood pressure adjusted for age and um, uh, adjusted for age and percentile over um, time um, for kids with hypertension, uh, not as common as adults with hypertension, but at least equally important um, to manage well. And in six weeks, we had this smart app. It took about eight months to fit it, retrofit it into the Cerner system. But as soon as it was there, it was being used literally hundreds of times per week in the context of patients by our users. This started to get Cerner's attention, as did this app um, designed by David Krita, part of our smart team that actually um, uh, working with a design firm that looked so nice that electronic medical record vendors were pretty stunned that they could have something nice looking and running in their systems. And this app actually runs uh, across multiple pediatric settings now. The R is reusable. Um, it can be added or deleted. Our same uh, open source apps that we created years ago still are uh, very uh, robust um, and have both more commercial and more open source versions. Um, the, um, uh, this is our version of pharmacogenomics at Boston Children's Hospital using the Cerner dialog box. This took six months to get one dialog box for one drug gene pair uh, in a way that wasn't particularly extensible to any other side of care. Um, uh, here, um, Gil Alterovitz working with 23andMe in a few weeks mashed up 23andMe data with um, uh, EHR data through the SMART API with risk maps uh, showing an early version of genomic medicine at the point of care. Folk, Jeremy Warner's team at Vanderbilt took this uh, forward into the clinic. Um, there is something I won't talk about too much, but one of the key interoperability features here is, that's gonna become important soon is called CDS hooks. And CDS hooks triggers third-party decision support at the right moment in care in a completely interoperable way. This comes out of the SMART project um, and was designed um, by Josh Mandel, uh, working with Kevin Shackleton uh, at Cerner, um, and uh, I think will become an important compo workflow component for the apps and decision support world here is an example of an immunization decision support app where the, the, American, College, the, uh, the American College of Immunization, uh, uh, now I'm blanking out, the CDC ACIP group that does um, immunization uh, recommendations, their rules are running in one place and could potentially serve decision support in apps all over the country or the world rather than having each side of care program them in their own set of rules, which is exactly what happens now. 
Um, there is a smart app gallery, which runs on a back end sandbox um, so that the apps can be demonstrated. There's both synth synthetic and some real data in there as well. Um, and uh, this is an open and free uh, listing that a lot of companies and research groups find useful uh, for the purpose of um, displaying their apps. The, the, the first um, uh, big uh, implementation of um, SMART commercially at full scale was by Apple. Um, Apple actually hired a couple people from the SMART community, a couple people from my group, and uh, also Ricky Bloomfield from Duke, who was working with us implementing the SMART API at Duke. And they connected the iPhone health app to about more than 500 health systems now, I believe, um, with um, the SMART API so that you can get a copy of your record in fire format on the iPhone at all of these places. And Apple itself is now building an app store in uh, essentially in iOS that can use those data that came onto the phone through an open standard. Very important that they chose to use an open uh, API because that means that all the work that institutions like partners and others did to map and to work with Apple to be sure that they had a high integrity, high quality uh, data transfer onto the phone, um, all that work is not um, locked uh, in the relationship with Apple. When the Google Android equivalent of this comes along, and there are now Google Android equivalents of this, or Android equivalents of this, um, the very same work um, is reused, um, and the app is substitutable. So while the iPhone inspired our original approach, um, there's a nice circularity in that the iPhone health app is now a smart app. Um, uh, and so uh, here's the um, uh, smart logo on the Apple stage at the Worldwide Developers Conference. The CMS has an al analog to this. They initially had something called the blue button, which was uh, not done, in, which was a way for veterans to get a copy of their electronic medical record, but it was came out in no particular format. So it was designed to be a disruptive innovation, but it ended up being just more disruptive um, because the data were completely unusable. They reimagined this in the last uh, two years as by using, and we had encouraged them to do this for about five years, but they reimagined this using the SMART API um, in order to provision claims data to Medicare beneficiaries. At some point, Medicaid beneficiaries will be part of this as well. So now a patient can get their claims data as well as their electronic health record data on their phone um, in, uh, in apps for further computation and to drive other apps. So I don't do very much lobbying. I've done almost none, um, but I had one very successful trip to Washington DC. We're working with a couple senators and a couple representatives. We got a little bit of language into the 21st Century Cures Act signed by Obama in 2016. And basically what it says is there has to be an API in certified health IT that gives you access to all elements of a patient's record without special effort. And we argued to Don Rucker, who's the current coordinator of National uh, of, uh, Health Information Technology, National Coordinator of Health Information Technology, that without special effort means that it had to be completely standardized. And Don, who's um, a close colleague, is also a free market libertarian. And he said, Ken, we don't need regulation the business side of things, the market will handle this. And I said, there is no market because the health systems are locked in with their vendors and with their EHR vendors. And we need to create a market through some interoperability. And Don, in about a few months, went from saying, Ken, we don't need any regulation to eventually writing a 1,200 page rule. 
that rule handles both the API, but also information blocking provisions to make sure that data can flow to patients and data can flow um, to apps. Um, both at the individual level and, as I'll tell you in a moment, at the population level, too. There was a vigorous opposition at the last minute to the rule by EPIC. Um, it was really quite a kerfuffle. Um, and um, Zach and I wrote a piece that we've learned was influential in helping to get the rule over the goal line, um, which is in stat news. Um, really um, having to push back on EPIC for, um, at the last minute, um, uh, trying to scuttle interoperability, even though, in fact, they had been very good participants in the interoperability work that had been going on and in implementing SMART in their systems, and they actually um, did it better than any other electronic health record vendor. So it was a bit perplexing but not entirely surprising that this happened at the end. So just as the uh, pandemic was about to wash over us, the HIMSS uh, meeting, a very large um, meeting in Orlando, Florida, was supposed to have the president himself pop over from Mar-a-Lago and announce this rule based on the 21st Century Cures Act language, which was essentially based on the SMART project. Um, for whatever reason, um, uh, uh, Trump was unable to do it, uh, the main reason being that um, HIMSS wisely, at the last minute, decided not to bring 45,000 healthcare uh, professionals from all over the world together uh, as a pandemic uh, was brewing in the United States sometime around, I think, March 3rd. Amazingly in this rule, not only is the Smart on Fire API in there, but something that I'm gonna tell you about in the last couple minutes is there as well. The Smart HL7 bulk data API. Where did this come from? Well, Don Rucker at one of our meetings read a piece that Zach and I had written um, that I included in the program book on these federated networks, the things that Jeff was just talking about, the PCORnet network, the All of Us network, and we talked about how it was gonna be very important for healthcare systems to feel invested in the data they were producing. And what Don said is, if you want a healthcare CEO to care about the data you produce, it had better be about payment. And then Don said, why don't you create a way to export data on whole populations that's analogous to SMART, and this had always been on our to-do list, um, but no one really asked us to do it. And he said, and make it about payment initially. And so we, we held a meeting, we designed this flat fire export, taking advantage of all the work that the community had done over a six year period or eight year period on fire. Um, and flat fire ex exports from electronic health records in serialized NDJSON uh, format. Uh, with, you know, essentially lossless conversion from the fire that, uh, that, that's now required um, as to be, to be mapped um, for each um, electronic health record. This will be in place two years from now. Um, so in, I think, July 1st, 2022, all electronic health records will export population data sets in flat fire. Now, you know, for the I2B2 community, um, there is good news. I mean, there are a lot of interesting transforms, and I think these need to be hardened, but there's I2B2 to fire, there's fire, there's um, OMOP to fire uh, out of Georgia Tech. And we just have um, one minute. And, yep. And so these opportunities are um, to um, use these data and to think about them going forward, I think, are large. Um, there's, if you go to the SMART website, smarthealthit.org, you can see the list of tools, including the reference server implementation, bulk data tester, um, and a number of other things that we've produced for the community um, to start to play with this. Although, just to set expectations, these will not be in production, in use widely 
until about two years from now. So it gives you some time to think about it. Um, and uh, again, this is the uh, website to go to to learn a bit more about that. Um, I'll mention just also that CMS went totally to town on this standard. And again, um, mm -hmm. they making claims data available not only one at a time, it, one patient at a time in the blue button, uh, individual right of access, but also um, this thing called data at point of care where a healthcare organization can actually apply to get CMS claims data on its whole population and it will be exported in bulk fire format to those organizations, which I think will be another forcing function to get institutions to, to become used to using fire. Zach and I had a piece um, just at the beginning of the pandemic um, on some of the implications of the 21st Century Cures Act around what it means for data citizenship. And the one of the, and this is, and for folks who are keeping time, I'm just wrapping up. Um, the, 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 one of the reasons that Epic um, said that um, they were opposed to the rule is that an app, that a patient could direct her data to go into an app um, that was run by a predatory app company. Um, and there no doubt will be predatory app companies. And ONC, which regulates interoperability, does not regulate privacy. That's regulated by the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission. And so the FTC is now getting into the space of regulating health data. We also pointed out that you could have a non-market economy if there's a capture of these APIs by um, other uh, companies that then have a, have, a, have a second paywall. I so say you have the EHR, the, uh, the API, um, another company with a second set of paywalls, uh, which will either be high functioning uh, services or not, or the APIs could become so expensive to use that um, by app developers or by health systems that the app market never takes off. This is a real risk. Abuses and breaches, cybersecurity breaches could really scuttle things and digital divide, we must always keep our eye on. Um, it couldn't have been more starkly in play than watching um, uh, the disparities in the way children were able to access online education when schools went online. Um, and I think that's just an extra warning to us that um, we have to design fair um, uh, access to these new technologies. Um, Rahil Saeed and our group developed something called Smart Markers, which is an extension to the Smart API for patient-generated data and its capture. And in COVID, is this stuff useful yet? Well, the CDC has unveiled a fire-based app that's rep a reporting app that's sort of a point-of-care app to help with traditional styles of case reporting one patient at a time. It'll fill in part of the form for you. The doc fills in the rest. Unfortunately, doctors don't fill in case reporting forms, so I don't know how much this will be used. The bulk fire side of things would have been nice if it was ready for this pandemic. Not quite. Maybe the next one, or since this pandemic doesn't seem to be ending anytime soon, maybe this one as well. Up on the SMART website, you can see that to get from where we started when Zach and I wrote a piece about this, idea of an API for healthcare in the New England Journal of Medicine, all the way up to these rules being finalized, was not a coincidence. It took a village um, and uh, at some other time, I'm happy to tell you how many different uh, groups and organizations and efforts um, were involved in getting this thing to be standardized. So let me hold it right there because I'm sure we're at time, we're just a minute over. Thank you, Ken, that was really terrific. Really appreciate that. Um, the, the problem with doing these rapid fire talks is we don't have time for questions, but um, so we'll, we're going to have to jump into uh, the next one, but thank you.